Hello, this is Dr. Marty Lustig, Senior Vice President and Principal with NextGen Advisors. Welcome to our podcast series. In honor of October being Dental Hygiene Month, today's discussion will be dedicated to oral health. I'm joined by a couple of special guests, Carlos Vallecillo and Brian Peterson. Carlos is the sales executive for our dental software here at NextGen. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Marty. It's great to be here. And Brian is our Vice President and Managing Director for Dental Solutions. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Marty, and thanks for inviting us. Since you're both new to our podcast, let's take a minute to get to know you. Can you each tell us about what got you started on a career in oral health and what your focus is here at NextGen? We'll start with Carlos. Sure. So for me, it was a bit of an accident. That's a that's a story all in itself. But 30 years later, here I am. Um, I started as a dental tech in the Navy. Um, I made rank and I managed recruit in processing clinic. I got out. I managed dental group in Chicago and in Atlanta. Uh, my dad worked for IBM, so I've always been keen on technology. When I saw the opportunity in the mid to late 90s, I, tr I started working for a multimedia company working in dental. Then I moved to dental technology sales and then dental software sales, and here I am. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, and Brian, your turn. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, my uh, introduction into the dental industry came in 1997. I was introduced by a friend uh, into the industry. I had been working in the uh, automobile industry until that point, and I really didn't know much about the dental industry at that point. And now, 20 years later, I've had the opportunity to work within the dental industry. I've really formed a, a passion for the industry and for the business, and uh, I'm very excited to be here at, at uh, NextGen Healthcare at this point to apply some of what I've learned over those 20 years in the dental industry. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for sharing. So let's get started. Uh, in, in our October 5th blog, we discussed the history of dentistry and how it became separated from the rest of healthcare and some of the recent movements towards integration of the two. I'd be curious, given your backgrounds on the dental side of this issue, what struck you about this article, Brian? Yeah, I was, I was impressed by the article and uh, the great job it did in really showing and uh, going through how the divide between dentistry and medicine has kind of occurred over the years. I, I was most uh, impressed by and, and, and really the thing that, was, that stood out most to me was that that divide really doesn't need to be there. Uh, it, it really should not exist. And it really speaks to the importance of oral health in overall systemic health and how important it is that both are considered together, not separately. And it was interesting that the article pointed out that it's, it's been a number of years over time that that divide has, has been created and then exacerbated and become larger. We really need to work to bring that, uh, to bring the two disciplines more closely together and align them better together. Carlos, your thoughts? So I loved it. I, for me, um, probably what stood out the most thinking of the business side of dentistry is um, I really appreciated how you highlighted that insurance created uh, was partially responsible for that divide or for creating that divide. Um, you know, we see that today. We see that today where dentists are trying to expand their offerings for their patients and they're able to do many different things, but they're not able to bill um, medical insurance for them. And as we know, dental insurance has a very small cap on it. So, and it's limited to dental and, and the supporting structures. So yeah, very interesting. Well, it's an interesting point you raise about the insurance coverage, having myself worked in a medical insurance company, uh, a Blue Cross plan that also had a dental plan. One of the struggles we had was trying to sort out what was covered under the dental benefit versus what was covered under the medical benefit. And uh, as you know, very little of dental, what 
dentists do is actually covered under the medical benefit. But when it was, it was really complicated because dentists generally aren't in the credentialed in the network for medical services. So it was always out of network services, which creates its own complications. It just right. becomes further exacerbates this divide. So interesting you raised that particular issue. Um, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit more about this um, shift in nomenclature from dental health to oral health. Uh, within dentistry, how are attitudes changing in terms of how dentists and uh, other uh, dental professionals think about oral health? Is it changing the scope of their services? Or what do you see with that? Carlos, you want to start? Sure, thank you. So I, I don't think the shift necessarily is how dentists think about oral health. I think this is, they have been, you know, they have been focused on providing oral health for a long time. I actually think that there's, it really addresses the medical community at large, medical insurance companies, right? We have to remember that just like medical offices and, and anything else, dental offices are a business. Um, and really, to some extent, this is a part that we can own ourselves, but EHRs and, and EDHR, electronic dental health records, you know, when you have systems that are disparate and, you know, for dental, you have to, for, for dental practice management, you have to capture different information than you do for medical. And um, up until very recently, there haven't been systems that either can interoperate and communicate with each other or that can capture some of the information that would be needed to be able to coordinate care. So I think that some of those have been the changes and I think that we're closing the chasm here. Brian, your thoughts there? I agree 100% with Carlos's comments that we are closing the chasm. And as we do so, we do see a better alignment between medical and dental or oral health. As, as that alignment takes place, we have to find ways to technologically connect the two, to technologically have a collaboration happening between the two. And so that's the business we're in, is helping in that inter interoperability space and, and giving that opportunity for more collaboration between the two. If, if there's no ability for that collaboration to happen, that divide will continue to exist. We have to provide an environment where there can be uh, accelerated and better collaboration and communication. Well, it's interesting you bring up the interoperability issue. I personally live in an area where there's a fairly robust uh, community-based health information exchange. It's been in place for 15 years and has inputs from throughout the healthcare system, all the laboratories, all the radiology, all the hospitals, all, you know, basically all of the physician's offices, even um, nursing homes and uh, ambulances are connected, but dental is not. I don't believe dental has been approached yet. And even as mature as it is, I think it's, it, it's not top of mind for people on the healthcare side to think, think about that. Yeah, I also think that has a lot to do with the dental solutions that have been available up until very recently. They, um, they have not had the ability to share information with HIEs. They just don't have the tools or information to do that. And that changed, um, you know, very recently with the Affordable Care Act and they were driving for different results and, and expectations and certifications. And there were a handful of dental records or EDHRs that were um, that decided to move forward with that. Those that did have the capability of participating in HIEs or even um, interfacing with other EHRs to create a whole solution. So I think that that's just part of it. That's really encouraging. Let me shift to a, a slightly different topic. It seems to me that there's a significant difference between dental practices that are either in academic centers or in community health centers versus those that are in private practice. Each of you talk a little bit more about what you see as the differences and similarities and the importance of that. Brian, you want to start? 
Absolutely. I think the similarity is that all those providers, whether in private practice or uh, in a community health service practice, a community health center practice, excuse me, are concerned about the, the patient and the, the oral health care of that patient. The difference, I think, is primarily around proximity. <laughs> I think it's, it's easier for that community health center to collaborate between the oral health and medical side of the house, again, simply because of proximity. They're there together in the same building. Uh, they're, they're easily accessible to one another and there's natural collaboration taking place. Again, it comes down, in my opinion, to that communication being easier to facilitate between the two. So I think that's the big difference. Both are dedicated to the oral health of their patients and making sure that they are doing all that they can do from a technology standpoint to best serve their patient community. Carlos? No, I completely agree with Brian. I think that when you look at, uh, uh, when I'll address public health specifically, but when you look at community health centers and even hospitals, they're usually owned by the same entity, whether it's a government or a uh, public health institution. And so that funding funnels down to the same place. So they look for products that are going to be able to share information. And so they're, they have the same pool of patients. Uh, most dental practices, even DSOs, are, are silos onto themselves. They're not, you're seeing some shift in that with Pacific Dental um, and some other ones that are starting to move into the medical sphere. But, but up until this point, you've seen these siloed dental institutions, private institutions. I think the other thing is, it's just, just the nature of the business. So when you're in private enterprise, whether a solo practice or a DSO, your funding comes directly from your patients or through the insurance companies. Um, when you're in community health centers, you're either through grants um, or government money, and those are driven by outcomes, and especially again, uh, Affordable Care Act, um, those outcomes drive a lot of what is required out of the community health centers and hospitals, and you just don't have that requirement in private practice. Yeah, it's interesting. So you, you know, there's the co-location that you see in the community health centers. There's the difference in the way the funding comes through. And I think combined with that, there's also a, in general, although I know there's some management uh, differences within a community health center, there's some common management infrastructure that tends to tie those services, the healthcare and the dental services together, the medical and dental together. Um, so. I, uh, I think you've you raised important points there. Um, if, if we flip that question a little bit and we've identified some of the uh, differences there, how does that play into what you see as what needs to change in order for us to take whatever the next steps are in improving the level of integration between dental care and medical care and make it all part of healthcare? Ryan, you wanna start? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and start. Uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit like a broken record, um, I, I think that that collaboration and communication uh, between the oral health community and the medical community is of paramount importance. And the ability to gain access to one another through technology continues to be very important. We're really good today at being able to track referrals, for example. We need to become better at actually collaborating with one another and being able to understand how oral health affects systemic overall health and vice versa. And that's going to take open communication. It's gonna take, again, better technology, different technology to bring those two groups together and, and again, kind of mend this divide that has occurred over a long period of time. Carlos, your thoughts? So um, I think that I'll address two points. The first one being the one that we can control, the three of us speaking here, and that is that um, EDHRs and EHRs driving interoperability will, will allow for coordinated care um, and the expansion of coordinated care and sharing of information, I think that is going to be critical. Um, and I think the other thing is um, dentists and physicians want to 
provide the best outcomes for their patients possible. So I don't think necessarily that, that it's something that the dentists don't want to do or even that the physicians don't want to happen. I think that they definitely want this to happen. So I think that just removing any barriers, allowing them to work together um, is going to make a big difference. And with that, again, it's a business. And I think that with insurance, reimbursement is going to be a big deal. You know, if dentists are going to be doing, which they can do today, if they're going to be capturing blood pressures, height, weight, uh, temperature, if they're going to be capturing, documenting any lesions or potential, you know, doing biopsies and sending them to the lab, those things are all things that can be done in a dental office, sent to a lab and then communicated to both the physician and the dental offices. But in order for them to invest their time, they have to be reimbursed for that. So I think you're both raising really critical issues. The one thing that I would add is training as a pediatrician. You know, I'm trained to do a lot of diagnostic, uh, you know, in, uh, work in, in the mouth in, on physical exam. But that said, as far as the teeth themselves are concerned, our training is pretty much limited to identifying obvious tooth decay and referring to a dentist. Um, beyond that, we really, you know, the teeth are kind of like, well, we don't spend a lot of time on them because that's the dentist territory. And I think likewise, um, dentists could easily be doing more preventive care uh, that goes beyond you know, the teeth and the gums. And I, they probably have better training than we do on the physician side to do more. But I do think training is another issue. Let me go to the last question I have for the two of you, and it relates to the pandemic. So we know that dental practices suffered, particularly in the spring when uh, everything shut down for all except emergency services. How do you view the current situation as, as it relates to the pandemic? And what do you think the lasting impact of COVID-19 will be on dental providers? Carlos, you want to start this one? Sure. So I, I think for me, being around this industry for a long time and understanding the value that it has for patients, I think one of the one of the things that affected the, the dental community at large was that they were deemed non-essential by many states and they were ordered to close. I think that that hurt a lot of patients. I think that they were patients that um, had, had valuable needs that were not addressed. And I think also it really did a disservice for these, what I will call oral health physicians, um, to be treated the same as nail salons or tattoo parlors or even great clips. Um, and I think that it really exposed the chasm of what people, the perception of dentistry and the reality of oral health. And I think that there's no clearer way to, to demonstrate that than what happened. As far as what the lasting impact of this, I the example that I use is if you dig a ditch and you're going to pour and you're thinking of pouring water you have an idea of where the water is going to go but until you pour the water you really have no idea what cracks and crevices it's going to find and where it's going to go and i think that that's in the situation that we're in i think that we can anticipate certain things coming out as a result of this but i think that there's a lot of uh, changes in the dental industry and even in the medical industry that we haven't even foreseen yet. I read something that the shutdowns have, I don't, I don't, I don't want to paraphrase, I want to paraphrase it the right way, but I, that the shutdown has lost Americans 2.5 million years um, in life or something like that. I don't, you know, so we have really no idea of how this is going to impact beyond dentistry. I mean, education as well, kids being virtually learning or the ones that are not applying themselves, you can, I mean, there's so many levels to that, but yeah, I think that the biggest impacts we don't even, we can't even foresee. Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely the, our oral health providers in this country were, um, were dramatically affected and suffered uh, because of the shutdowns that Carlos has referred to. Uh, in fact, there was a higher impact among dental professionals than amongst other healthcare professionals in general, studies have shown. Uh, 
the good news is now we're starting to see that normalize a little bit. We're starting to see 90 plus percent employment again in the industry. We're starting to see patient counts coming back into that 80% range. One of the things that I think will be an ongoing effect is that with higher standards for PPE requirements, for increased infection control or enhanced infection control, which by the way has had a positive effect. Uh, there's another study that shows that only about 1% of all dentists have been tested positive for COVID. So the the enhanced infection control that has been used in dental practices has been working. Uh, so all those things are very positive and good, but we may never with those, again, enhanced protocols, be able to get back to the number of patients that, uh, that oral health practitioners were seeing during a day, um, or it will be some time before we get back to that number. So that speaks to the fact that we have to become more efficient. We have to understand what it takes to become more efficient in order to maintain our productivity levels. And so, again, it kind of circles back to technology. It circles back to how can we better collaborate with uh, other healthcare professionals and how can we be more efficient day to day? I think that's how we address the ongoing effect of, of this pandemic. Well, uh, that's a great place, I think, for us to end it today. Uh, a special thank you to my guests, uh, Carlos Vallecillo and Brian Peterson, uh, and thank you to our listeners for joining in. If you enjoyed today's discussion, consider subscribing to our podcast. This is Dr. Marty Lustig with NextGen Healthcare. Have a great day.